Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Melissa Diaz. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Colorado Boulder and a fellow at the Institute of uh, Arctic and Alpine Research. And her research interests are centered around the applications of geochemical techniques towards understanding physical systems and how biology and society interact with them. Uh, her primary research focus is the cryosphere, mainly the Antarctic and Arctic, where she studies the transport, cycling, and alteration of salts, nutrients, and atmospherically derived constituents, so as to understand the effects of local and global change on resource-limited systems. Uh, she also studies the intersection of urban geochemistry with environmental justice, social equity, and knowledge co-production. Uh, Professor Diaz earned her PhD and master's degrees in earth sciences from the Ohio State University and her bachelor's in earth and environmental sciences from the University of Rochester. And uh, today she will be speaking on the topic meltwater features in Greenland and Antarctica and their roles in biogeochemical cycling. Welcome. Great. Thanks. Yeah, let me share my screen. Can you see it, Patrick? Can you nod if you can? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I know this is an international seminar too, right? So thanks for waking up early or staying up late, um, wherever part of the world you're in. Um, as Patrick said, I'm a geochemist. I work primarily in the cryosphere. Um, this is obviously a sea level rise seminar, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work that I do looking at intersections of glaciology and geochemistry, and then what that might mean in terms of uh, sea level rise, rise implications, particularly in Greenland. So um, I'm going to start with just this, and let me hide this here, sorry. Great. Um, so I'm just starting here with this, uh, a, a figure from Robin Bell's nature paper from 2018. And it's looking at meltwater in Greenland and Antarctica. So let me, um, hopefully you can see my mouse here. Uh, so on the left hand side of the screen, um, we have Greenland, right? And this is looking at the current melt. So the scale bar down at the the bottom here is just looking at millimeters of water equivalent per year um, of meltwater trends in Greenland. So if you take a step back and look generally at the uh, at Greenland, you'll see that the majority of melting we find is in southern Greenland or on, on the western margin. Uh, the northeastern side has considerably less melting, um, but we're still talking about potentially large volumes of water that are uh, uh, melting from the Greenland ice sheet. Antarctica is a little bit of a different story. I think we're going to find some really interesting studies coming out in the next couple of years. Uh, remember, this is from a few years ago, so uh, definitely warming has changed a bit in Antarctica. But here, this is looking at projected warming from uh, RCP 8.5 from the IPCC report. So right, this is our business as usual scenario. And we find that for the most part, most of East Antarctica along the Transantarctic Mountains, we don't really expect, at least according to um, these projections, to find considerable melt in East Antarctica in the future. Um, on the Antarctic Peninsula, we know that there has been considerable melt, uh, considerable contributions to sea level rise. Uh, and in the future, it's expected to rapidly increase. So this meltwater uh, can take a few different forms. Again, I really like this figure that Robin has published here. This is focusing primarily on Antarctica, um, looking at now current uh, surface melt in the middle here, and then a whole variety of different meltwater features that we can find in Antarctica. This uh, ranges from features like melt ponds. We have our subsurface lakes, um, which were excitingly uh, drilled into relatively recently. 
Um, we have really neat features like Moolins uh, or my personal favorite here, this uh, stream uh, that terminates into a waterfall on the Nansen ice shelf. So we have a variety of different ways that water can move in the cryosphere environment. This here fo focuses particularly on water that's on ice. However, we're also aware that there's a lot of water in periglacial environment, environments and glacial regions too. So this is just a little cartoon um, that I pulled from the internet looking at a variety of different features that you can have in periglacial environments. So here, right, we have our glacier um, coming down. Uh, we have these ice dammed uh, uh, marginal lakes here where those arrows are. Um, and then we have our bedrock dammed lake um, up here at a higher elevation. And then we have our proglacial lake um, dammed by a moraine and maybe the ice, depending on your system, uh, and obviously our proglacial streams and another lake. So this is just a, a couple of examples of features. Um, there are many more uh, that we can discuss later in this lecture. So I'm interested in particularly this question here, and I put a couple of cool photos from other studies in the background of this slide. Um, as a geochemist, uh, how does meltwater produ production record warming in the cryosphere? And how does this influence biogeochemical cycle cycles in polar regions, knowing that biodiversity, especially in Antarctica, is quite low? So the pictures in the background um, are just looking at how meltwater interacts with glacial environments and how meltwater interacts with uh, stratification in ocean systems. So to discuss this topic, I wanted to introduce uh, two different systems. So the first is proglacial lakes in Antarctica. Um, this is the first small part of the talk, looking at these lake systems. And then the second is looking at ice marginal lakes in Greenland. So again, coming back to that photo or cartoon I showed a couple of slides ago, um, looking at the diversity of meltwater features we have in the cryosphere and thinking about how these might relate to sea level rise in addition to biogeochemical cycling. So uh, let's talk about meltwater accumulation in the Transantarctic Mountains. All of you are probably familiar with this uh, picture here. It's just a Landsat image of the Antarctic continent. Um, we have the East Antarctic ice sheet over on my right-hand side. I'm assuming it's yours too. Um, and then on the left-hand side, uh, we have the Western Antarctic ice sheet. These are separated by the Transantarctic Mountains. You can see that as this dark area that traverses the continent. I've pointed out a couple of features here. Uh, McMurdo Station, it's the largest permanent US base on the continent. Um, peak season, it can breach 1,200 people, um, which is pretty amazing in Antarctica. We have the Ross Ice Shelf here. So the glaciers from the East Antarctic Ice Sheet flowing through the Transantarctic Mountains and some from the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet flow um, over the sea here to form the Ross Ice Shelf. And then a couple of cool places so we have the McMurdo Dry Valleys, um, right where my little laser pointer is. This is the largest continuous ice-free area in Antarctica. And then we have uh, a special study site here, Shackleton Glacier, that's about 85 or so degrees south, so pretty close to the South Pole. I was at Shackleton Glacier uh, in 2018. Um, we were actually there with a team of biologists. Um, so this is our team here and our mountaineer um, over on the far right. Uh, this was a pretty cool site. Shackleton is one of those places that we've only visited a handful of times. Um, so it was neat to go around and check out all these different locations. As I said, this was a, actually a biology program. I was invited on as a geochemist to look at salts and nutrients. The biologists were looking to study how ecosystems structure and function following large scale changes in climate, such as advance and retreat of glaciers. So this is me working with our mountaineer to dig a shallow soil pit to do beryllium 10 work um, to uh, get some surface exposure ages. And I apologize, you might hear my cat meowing in the background. Um, so we went around to a bunch of these different sites. We collected samples. Um, and this is my dear colleague, Diana Wall, 
uh, super excited because we found this uh, rare uh, white calimbola. So that's a microarthropod that hadn't been actually found since the 1950s. So it was a pretty exciting trip. Um, one of the things we did though, is we took a lot of reconnaissance flights. So this is an image from a reconnaissance flight uh, flying over uh, Mount Hekin, um, if you're familiar with the mountains uh, in uh, the central Transantarctic mountains. So as we were flying around, uh, we found this lake and I said, well, that's really curious. Um, why, it's interesting that we have these lakes here. Uh, so I snapped this picture and uh, a few other pictures and I convinced our team to actually go down into this bowl and sample this lake. And I came back and I talked to then my PhD advisor and I said, hey, actually we found these lakes um, and we found two of them, which was pretty neat. And he goes and he says, well, actually, I think there's supposed to be three. Uh, David Elliott actually was there in the mid nineties uh, and he you know, collected some samples. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure that there were two. Um, so we went back and forth for a little bit before we shared our photos. Now I'm gonna take a step back and talk about uh, why there might be a little bit of a difference between David Elliott's account and my account from 2018. First, um, let me talk about annual temperature trends. Uh, so this here is just a, uh, uh, an image looking at annual temperature trends from 1957 to 2016 across Antarctica and uh, far southern tips of southern hemispheric current, uh, continents. Uh, this here is just our color bar looking at decadal trends in temperature. So your blue colors are cooling trends and your reds and oranges, those are warming trends. So we see um, these discrete stations here, those are um, notified by these dots. So for the most part across most of Antarctica, we find that uh, decadal long uh, warming trends are pretty prevalent, though we do have a couple of instances of uh, cooling trends, particularly in East Antarctica. Uh, the uh, a uh, Kriging function you see around here, those are from oceanographic measurements. Um, so they uh, uh, did some extrapolations and interpolations uh, to look at warming trends in the ocean as well. So, you know, again, one of the things that we see really obviously is that we have these darker red colors here. We know that Western Antarctica um, generally has the greatest warming across Antarctica um, and that Eastern Antarctica is moderately warming. Though you might notice that we don't have really any data from the Transantarctic Mountains. And that one dot you see there is from the Kiwi base um, uh, near McMurdo. Um, so we have really just one data point on an island. Um, we don't actually have along the Transantarctic Mountains this nice long term uh, temperature uh, trend data. This is particularly important because the Transantarctic Mountains are a really dynamic system. So this is a picture of me and my uh, colleague um, uh, up on a, a hillside in Taylor Valley in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. So Wales Glacier is behind us. We're looking at Commonwealth Glacier, this beautiful Piedmont Glacier here. This is the valley floor. And then the Ross Sea is what you see over on the right-hand side. So this is an environment where we have water and ice that's interacting with soils. We have lakes, we have ephemeral streams. We know that in this system, when you have increased melt, it's going to affect the albedo of the surface. We know that these soils are primed for chemical weathering because of the lack of liquid water that flows. So when we do have streams that flow, the rates of chemical weathering in these streams are, are extremely high. And this in turn influences our stream and soil ecology. So when we have this wetting, when we have increased melting, it causes these soils to flourish. So now you develop mosses and lichens that weren't there previously. In our streams, you have an abundance of algal mats, of a variety of different species and diatoms that live in these mats. So when we have melting in these systems where water and ice are interacting with soils, you can actually have some really interesting chemistry and biology as a result.
So I'm going to talk about uh, warming in these three different systems in Antarctica, starting with the McMurdo Dry Valleys, moving further south to Darwin, and then ending with Shackleton Glacier to continue that story um, that I had, or that, that discussion I had with, with Barry Lyons about David Elliott's work. So let's start with the McMurdo Dry Valleys. This here is a picture of Lake Hoar. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of a moat and then the lake ice on top. What's interesting about uh, the um, this system or these lake systems in Antarctica is for the most part, actually, um, we had a cooling trend in the Transantarctic Mountains for a long time. Um, and you can see that in the lake record. So this here is just a simple graph looking at depth of the lake over on the Y axis and then uh, chloride concentrations on the x-axis. The different colors and shapes here represent different years. So what we had for actually um, over a decade was a cooling trend. And you can see that with cryo concentration in, in our, in our uh, upper lake water. So as uh, we have this cooling trend, our lake ice uh, thickens on top. And what that does is it cryo concentrates our chloride. So you'll see increases in chloride concentration throughout time. And then we hit this point in 2001, where now we had this decade of freezing. And then all of a sudden we had actually this melt year. And I wasn't there in Antarctica for this year, but there are accounts that talk about waterfalls flowing off of these glaciers. The streams had flooded their stream beds. It was a really, really dramatic event for a system that's not used to that much water. So after that year, now we, in one season, actually just a few weeks of meltwater, we actually reset back um, over a decade of water chemistry in this upper layer, just from that one melt event that lasted a few weeks. So again, even a relatively short duration warming events can have a drastic impact on chemistry uh, in the dry valleys. Let's move a little bit further south to the Darwin Glacier. Um, so this is a, a study or a couple of studies led by Jenny Webster Brown. Um, so this is the Darwin Glacier here. And then we have Lake Wilson, which is actually an ice marginal lake um, here just along the side of that glacier. So um, here on the right-hand side, or sorry, yeah, the right-hand side, um, we have another graph. Um, so we have temperature over on the upper x-axis, conductivity on the bottom, and then we have lake depth uh, in meters in 1993 and then 1975 on the left and right, respectively. So you can look at this and you can find some general trends, but what I find most interesting is just even simply looking at the lake deepening. So in 1975, the lake was about 85 meters deep, uh, but then in uh, 1993, so uh, about uh, uh, 20 years later, uh, we have actually uh, a deepening of the lake of 20 meters. So this pretty large uh, change in lake depth. And if you look at this graph, uh, the temperature of the lake has actually changed as well. Um, it's, gotten, it's gotten warmer. So now uh, we can come back to our uh, Shackleton Glacier story. Um, so this is actually um, a fun, cute little study that was recently published just this summer, um, looking at lake systems along Shackleton Glacier. So Shackleton flows here um, through these exposed peaks of the central Transantarctic Mountains. We actually visited a variety of these different features. Um, and while we were visiting these sites, we noticed that there were a couple of sets of ponds. So we have this Heakin Valley system that's the furthest south. Um, so that's that picture I had shown you earlier in this uh, presentation, right, of that large lake system and this uh, subsidiary lake. And then we actually found that there was a, a pretty interesting lake system just a little bit further south at this site called Thanksgiving Valley, um, where we found a couple of ponds there. So coming back to this story, I contacted the Polar Geospatial Center and I said, hey, it's actually really difficult for me to find images. I'll show you in a couple of slides, but 
Um, even looking at uh, REMA, the reference elevation map of Antarctica, um, trying to look at a lot of different satellite products. It's so far south that the coverage is just not great here. Um, and then also the shadows are super harsh. Um, and you'll see that in the next slide. So I reached out to PGC and I asked for a little bit of help. We found uh, this image here from a Navy flyover in 1960. So you can see that there's a little pond uh, right at the toe of that glacier, and then we have two ponds that follow it. This actually coincides with the David Elliott study from 1996. So you see that tiny little pond right at the toe of the glacier, and then you have these two ponds um, slightly further out. This uh, arrow here is pointing to a dry lake bed that they identified. So um, this is really the source of that confusion. These are those three ponds that Barry Lyons mentioned, as opposed to my two ponds that we see here over on our 2018 side. So um, we found another flyover image from 2007. So now we can see that those that that little pond at the toe of the glacier had merged with the two further out. And then that black arrow was where that dry pond bed was. So this all merged now by 2007 into one larger pond or lake. And then we find that when I was there in 2018, that it had actually, right, uh, overflowed to form this subsidiary lake in 2018. So this was really interesting because there have been several, uh, I shouldn't say studies, but suggestions that the central Transantarctic mountains have been uh, effectively buffered from global uh, climate change and from uh, continent scale warming trends. But we see here that there is some meltwater that actually was generated. Um, so we can track some of that growth using satellites, um, which most of you are familiar with. This was pretty easy because I'm not looking at a global scale or a continental scale process. This I'm focusing on a specific region. So again, with the help of PGC, we were able to find uh, satellite imagery from 2009, 2010, and then 2018. Um, so we can do just a really crude estimate of area. And we can actually see that in 2009, right, that pond had actually formed. Um, in 2010, you can see some of this water spilling over a sill, maybe some flow from a stream here. Um, and then in 2018, that pond had actually grown significantly and started encroaching on that sill. Let's talk about the uh, lakes in Thanksgiving Valley. So this here is a picture of uh, Lake Abel, which was the bigger of the two uh, little lakes or ponds that we saw. So I had mentioned Diana. She's actually the one in the little uh, red coat there, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. So this site was fun for us because there had actually been a little bit of work. Um, so Brenda Hall's student uh, had actually uh, published a master's thesis on this back in 2013. So they uh, looked at the different ponds that we have in Thanksgiving Valley. Um, there's this really, really large, completely frozen lake um, that they call Thanksgiving Lake. This is another one of those ice marginal lakes. So here they're looking at an elevation profile, right? So we're sort of in this uh, low lying area here with a topographic high and water flowing downhill. Shackleton Glacier is significantly lower at elevation. So um, what they did too in this study is they actually collected some dried algal mat uh, samples and they did some carbon-14 dating um, to try and estimate glacial retreat. We did do beryllium-10 work on this site as well, which was fun to see how it lined up with their algal uh, mat data. Um, but you can see this like dry pond bed here, that's your ghost lake. So this was our first indication that this is actually a pretty dynamic system, um, knowing that there's nothing in this photo, but they had suggested there was water in their study. So this site, uh, shadows were a lot better than that Mount Heakin site, so we were able to get a much better temporal resolution. So I've created just this little cartoon showing the changes in lake area. Um, for these two different systems. So this is a spillover lake, right? Ghost Lake. So as soon as Lake Abel reaches this critical threshold, water flows downhill and fills uh, Ghost Lake. 
So here you can see uh, it fills up pretty rapidly. And then for, uh, in this case, seven years, it actually starts to evaporate down, um, decreasing in area until it's, it's going to refresh at some point in time. So we collected some water samples from these sites. Um, here we're just looking at um, delta deuterium and delta O18 of our water isotopes to look at water source. Um, someone had suggested initially that maybe it was just coming from thawing ground ice. In fact, what we see is that if we plot our samples along the local meteoric water line and the local uh, for ice and then the local meteor meteoric water line for snow, we actually find that they, they plot um, just beneath here on sort of this straight line of evaporation. So right where we have Ghost Lake with this strong evaporative signal, Lake Abel slightly less, and then our Hecan ponds, which are a little bit uh, newer, newer, fresher. Um, so this right is suggesting that our water, as we thought, is actually indeed sourced from snow and ice melt uh, at higher elevations. And now let's put this uh, these data in context. So here we're looking at flow from the Onyx River. This is the longest river that flows in the uh, McMurdo Dry Valleys. It also is our longest stream flow record in Antarctica. So we have discharge here on the y-axis and year going back to 1970 on our x-axis. We know that sometime between 1975 and 1993 that Lake Wilson had increased in depth by 20 meters. We know that uh, the Hecan Lakes had merged sometime between 1996 and 2006, 2007. Now, right, this is that large, large melt year here uh, in 2001, 20, 2002. So we can't make any inferences there, but um, again, it's a little bit uh, interesting that we have that lake merge at that time frame. We can move forward, though. We know that in 2009, based off of our satellite imagery, that, that subsidiary lake formed at, lake, at Mount Hecan. This was another really dramatic melt year, according to the recent record. Um, and then we know that that subsidiary lake is growing and that our ghost lake in uh, Thanksgiving Valley is filling uh, along this time period. So we can see, actually, if you, again, take a step back, this quasi-synchronous um, warming trend in Antarctica. So coming back to the biology aspect of this, um, we know that high concentrations of salts negatively impact soil taxa. Um, so this is a paper that we published from that Shackleton work where uh, black here represents a positive correlation and red represents a negative correlation. So when we have high total salt concentrations, that causes a decrease in abundance of your dominant species. Whereas if you have high soil nitrate, there's a slightly positive, sort of waving your hand here, uh, influence on supporting your dominant species. And then we have actually a study of the impact on uh, endemic taxa from that melt season. So here, this is looking at summer mean air temperature trends from uh, late 80s uh, to around that melt year, um, which is shown here with this annual flow is that large bar. And then um, they're also looking at solar uh, flux. On the bottom, we're looking at two different species of uh, nematode worms, which are seen as indicator species of change. So Scott Nema um, is a specialist organism that uh, does well in extremely dry, salty soils. Our Eudora limus is more of a generalist species, um, which can exist in a variety of different environments. Um, so Scott, Dem Scott Nema is our endemic organism here. Um, so we see here that actually in most cases um, in uh, the 90s, our Scott Nema actually was the dominant taxa. Um, and then when we, uh, for the for the most part, um, and I think that it's trends sort of follow that cooling trend. And then we move over uh, to that post-warming year, and we see this actually drastic shift in community, where now our Eudora limus have increased uh, in their numbers and Scott Nema have decreased. 
Um, and this actually has a really strong correlation with what we see with our warming and meltwater trends in Antarctica. So just to take away from that first portion here, um, we obviously have evidence of increased meltwater in the dry valleys of the Transantarctic Mountains. Um, so this is actually water that isn't typically accounted for. Um, they're usually or typically in uh, closed uh, basins, uh, but still important as uh, metrics for change in uh, a glacial volume. We can look at our water isotopes and ion geochemistry, which I didn't discuss here, but it's in that paper, um, and indicate that it's it truly is coming from our, our snow and our glaciers. Um, some of these changes might have been gradual, like Lake Wilson, but others appear to be rapid, like that sudden appearance of uh, that subsidiary lake in uh, 2009. The timing appears to be quasi-synchronous with increased melt in the Transantarctic Mountains. Um, so this is clear evidence that we do, in fact, have a dynamic hydrologic system in the Transantarctic Mountains. It might be indicative of long-term warming trends in East Antarctica, but we definitely need a lot more studies uh, to try and find more evidence of this meltwater. These ponds or this environment at Shackleton Glacier, they're not that special, right? We just were lucky and happened to fly across it in a helicopter and pointed out that it was there. That high south, um, it's as you all know, it's very difficult to get um, great satellite imagery, but it's definitely doable. And I think it's necessary to get an idea of what meltwater looks like uh, in the Transantarctic Mountains. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, the second part. So we talked about these proglacial lake systems um, in these closed basins. And now let's talk about ice marginal lakes and their storage. So this is uh, a figure I borrowed from Penelope Howe's nature study looking at ice marginal lakes in Greenland. So she separated these lakes into a few different quadrants um, and then counted how many lakes there are and quantified their area. Well, one of the other cool things that uh, she's done is she not only, like I said, looked at the total area, um, but she made some predictions as to possible future ice marginal lakes um, up to the year 2100 um, and what the lakes are now, and then looking at potential changes in their extent um, for the Greenland ice sheet. Now, this is really important because um, as she notes in her paper and as others have noted uh, in the past, these ice marginal lakes and other proglacial lakes are not typically included in sea level rise estimates, even though some of these lakes aren't closed basin. In fact, they might have streams that drain into the ocean, or they might be ice dammed and have uh, a glacial lake outburst floods that contribute water. So I'm going to focus on this central west portion um, right near Disco Bay or Lulasat, if you're familiar with Western Greenland. So this is just a picture of our glacial catchment here. It's pretty small. It's one of the smaller glacial catchments. Um, and then we have a Lulasat here and uh, Disco Island. Um, so um, here is just an image of our lake system uh, that we're studying. It's Lake Tinanilic. It's just south of Alulasat. So many of you are familiar with the Jakobshavn Ice Fjord here. Um, so this is just a little bit south of, south of that, connected to this fjord system um, uh, here that I'm outlining. Um, so this uh, lake is really interesting. It's huge um, in terms of area. It's about 40 square kilometers. Um, we actually went and sampled this lake back in 2018. Um, so we collected these samples here. There's a little ice marginal lake that appears to be unknown. Um, so this lake here, the topographic low is along Sarkardliup Glacier. So this is that glacier that flows north uh, into Sarkardlik Fjord. This fjord system uh, eventually connects with Jakobshavn Fjord. Um, as I alluded to, this system is really neat because it, it drains um, and it drains a lot of water. So this is a study here from 2017 looking at drainage pattern um, from one of its more recent drainages in 2014. So here we're looking at lake water level in meters. Um, they've actually measured the uh, rebound um, of following lake drainage. And then over on the right-hand side is looking at lake level change. 
So what we see is that in a relatively short amount of time, we actually have a pretty significant drop off in lake water levels. In fact, it's on the order of 65 meters, um, which is a large amount of water. It's actually, um, when you calculate the volume, it's on the order of two cubic kilometers in less than a week, or um, over the course of a month, it's close to three cubic kilometers of water. So we're talking about significant volumes of water that rapidly uh, enter the fjord system. You might be asking, how does this happen? Um, here, I think, is the prevailing hypothesis. So this cartoon here is showing this ice marginal lake that's dammed by the glacier here on the right-hand side. And we have this uh, uh, mathematical flotation level. So when the lake uh, levels are below that flotation level, um, there's not enough energy in the system to actually cause the front of that glacier to be buoyant. Um, and so as a result, we have sealed conduits at the bottom of that glacier. However, now as the lake flows, um, we all know that ice is less dense than water. Um, so that large volume of water actually has enough of that buoyant energy uh, to then cause the front of that glacier to lift slightly and actually cause some of that water drainage beneath um, that glacier in a subglacial conduit. So in this system, because we have so much of that hydrostatic pressure now, um, it can overcome the burden of that ice pressure and open up these conduits to cause draining. We have some uh, field evidence as well to suggest this. So uh, in this paper here, Laura Stevens is looking at this glacial front system. Um, so you can see the front right there um, terminating into the fjord. That's that red line here that she's delineated. Um, so here, uh, walking around this site, we've identified a, a, a couple of potential spots where there might be subglacial drainage. Here where this arrow is, there's actually a persistent subglacial pool. It's a little bit north. I actually think that it follows what seems like it might be a fault um, that, that goes actually underneath this glacier here. Um, and then there's another similar system and similar persistent pool um, uh, over here on the little ice marginal lake. So what we think happens is when these lakes are large enough, um, this one fills and drains every year about, this one every like five to 10 years. Um, so water is going to flow and maybe come out on that side um, where we can see a little bit of sediment there. And then we're thinking that there might be some uh, subglacial conduit that discharges here. This actually coincides with some of Laura's work where she thinks that there's this drainage point um, here along that far left, left side and that there's another drainage point uh, here, um, right on that D1, which is actually one of the more primary uh, drainage zones on this glacier. So she actually looked at glacial velocity too, um, uh, before and after a drainage event. So here, um, the color on the glacier is representing ice surface velocity, where red is a faster velocity, and these lines at the front are representing a change in front over time. So what she finds is that she thinks that there's some water exit here. I actually think that it might be a little bit more on land, but frankly, there's probably multiple conduits. Uh, and then the water drains and she sees a surge in glacial velocity rate at that drainage point that she's identified uh, for D1. So there's evidence here, um, right? And, and techniques that we can use to track some of this uh, subglacial drainage. Why is this important to me as a, as a geochemist? Well, so subglacial drainage happens in nearly every catchment uh, uh, along the Greenland ice sheet. So for systems that have terminate, termini in fjords, um, usually there's actually not enough water to overcome the uh, stratification of the fjords. So again, there's not enough buoyant energy of that plume uh, to actually move it to the photic zone. There's a lot of evidence, uh, recent papers that have suggested that some of that subglacial water is actually quite nutrient rich. So you end up with these nutrient deficient waters at the surface. And even though you have nutrient rich water that does enter, again, it's coming at the bottom and there's not enough volume to overcome uh, that stratification. So that water is just gonna diffuse on its way up. Here um, in this uh, second panel, um, this is either looking at a situation where the fjord is more shallow or if you have more meltwater. 
water. So in the case where now we're, we're uh, draining two to three cubic kilometers of water in that narrow fjord, um, it's very likely that our fjord water actually has enough of that buoyant energy to overcome diffusion and actually make it to the photic zone and enhance primary productivity. And we see this actually. So I found this super cool sociology paper where somebody went around and actually interviewed fishermen that fish in this fjord system. So they said, um, I put a couple of quotes here, so sorry for giving you a presentation uh, with a bunch of words on a slide. Um, but here they're showing that, uh, or they're saying that uh, one of the fishermen had actually been in Lake Tinanilic um, shortly after a drainage event. And you could see how much the water level had changed and uh, observed that there was a, a muddy lake water um, revealed after the drainage event. Um, others reported worm-like organisms. So, right, this is in quotes um, after the drainage event. And they found this yellowish slime um, that becomes um, uh, more uh, frequent following these events. And then lastly, they notice that this slime affects their fishing negatively. So the slime is actually enclosing their baits uh, and seems to prevent halibut from being caught. So, right. What I see as a geochemist and as a bio geo, putting my biogeochemistry hat on is that this yellowish slime is clearly algae. So when this lake is draining, it seems to be triggering an algal bloom in this fjord system um, that's negatively affecting fisheries um, in coastal Greenland. So as I mentioned, and I don't have much time, so I'll, I might go through some of these slides a little bit faster. Um, but we collected a bunch of samples in this pre-drainage system, looking at not only lake samples along the shore, but also collecting some source samples as well. Um, these are just a couple of pictures of, of what they look like. We have this subglacial pool here, um, which is where we think that the primary drainage is. Um, we have this ice marginal lake, so high, or sorry, stream, so high water rock interaction. Um, and here's a picture of that lake. So we collected samples for water isotopes to look at water source, and then we also looked at the soluble uh, and dissolved fractions of metals. Taking a quick look at water source, um, so uh, TIN is Lake Tinanilic, LIM is the Little Ice Marginal Lake. We find that 74% approximately of the lake water um, is coming from glacial source, which again makes sense. We know that we have subglacial discharge into the system and superglacial discharge. Uh, and then for the little ice marginal lake, it's actually more of a terrestrial source. So you might have picked it up. I went a little fast. Um, there's a tarn um, that actually drains into the little ice marginal lake as well. Um, so uh, we're really interested in iron. Um, in this system in the fjord, it's probably not a limiting nutrient, but it is, we know, uh, just past the coast in Greenland. So here we're looking at dissolved iron, which is our less bioavailable form. And then we're looking at our soluble iron. So that's the iron that biology uh, really wants um, over in green. We compared these data to a few different sites. So our fjord is here. Um, and then Leverett Glacier is a nearby glacier with a similar underlying lithology. So um, here are two on the bottom, TS is terrestrial stream, MS is marginal stream, and then we have our different systems. Our two lakes are over on the far left-hand side. We find that the streams in the Little Ice Marginal Lake catchment, um, so that's over here, um, those have the highest dissolved iron, so lots of that uh, larger form iron. But in terms of our more bioavailable iron, um, Lake Tinanilic actually has the highest uh, uh, amount of iron and significantly greater than our comparable site over at Leverett Glacier. So right, this is uh, a couple of orders of magnitude larger. Um, we looked at the stoichiometry of the system. I'm not gonna say much about this in the interest of time, um, but really what we're showing is that there's uh, normalized to iron, a lot more of uh, iron compared to these other essential nutrients. So like this is your red field ratio, right? You're familiar with your um, uh, C and P ratios. This is just extending to metals. 
Um, so this is suggesting that there's some complicated complexing of, and settling of metals or some removal from biology. Now, um, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to talk about um, the post-drainage system. So we were really fortunate to be watching this lake and we were able to go back after it drained. So you can see all these pinks now are all of our new samples. So this time we brought a boat. Um, we can actually collect uh, samples at depth. Um, we visited a bunch of different new sites, um, collected new stream samples, and it was a really, really fun trip. Um, so you can see the outline just crudely that I've drawn here of where the lake levels were um, pre-drainage and then now where they are post-drainage. Um, I hope the sound is off for this. I didn't actually check. Um, it's not. I'm sorry if this is really loud. Hold on. So you can see actually when you're on land, it's really easy to discern where that high scan of the lake is. You have all of these lake sediments that are deposited and then above that, um, it's this like super hard line of, uh, of now we have this uh, rock, uh, exposed rock on top. So when we went back, we collected not just for metals, but we were able to collect ions and nutrients. Um, we got the metals again, water isotopes, and then this time we were able to collect some samples for biology. So this is my colleague Maria that's driving our boat. Um, so this is just a tongue of that glacier there. So very briefly, um, we're looking at the stream samples here. Green is still our most bioavailable. Um, these are the six different streams that we sampled and then compared to this marginal stream. We find that uh, our marginal streams, MS, actually have much higher iron than back in 2018. This is probably not surprising considering it's still pretty turbid um, from that large drainage event, uh, but that we also see a lot more of that bioavailable iron too, um, particularly in our terrestrial stream. Similar view now looking at the lakes. Um, so we collected, like I said, at the surface and at depth, and then compared to this big ice marginal lake or you know, that system that we got in 2018. Um, so the iron is actually lower um, uh, than in the streams. Um, most of it is that large colloidal iron. Um, and then that soluble iron fraction really doesn't seem to be apparent at all um, in these lake systems. Um, so that was actually pretty surprising to us that we don't find any of that bioavailable iron anymore. We briefly looked at ions. Um, so again, we have now our streams and our lakes combined. So here, sulfate in gold, uh, chloride in blue, and the nitrate in green. Our streams really don't have uh, much nitrate in them. We have a bit of accumulation in the lake. Um, this is important because nitrogen for sure is a limiting nutrient in the fjord. We also have plenty of sulfate, um, but this obviously is in a system that's suitable for sulfate reducers because we have a well oxygenated water column. Like even to 85 meters depth, it's still actually very well oxygenated in the lake. And then uh, we looked at biology. Um, so here we're looking at uh, dissolved organic carbon just in PPM. Um, so this is our 2018 swatch over on the left hand side. And then we have 2022 on the right hand side. There's not that much of a difference. Um, 2018 looks very similar to 2020 for the most part, right? These are all similar concentration, except when you get way over here and you're like, wow, stream three and stream four, why do they have so much DOC? Well, we actually went and we looked at the relative size fractions of iron and those are the two uh, streams that actually had that, the highest amount of that um, bioavailable iron. This wasn't surprising to us though, because I collected a couple of biofilm samples and you can actually see that there are some abundant um, algal mats here. Um, so this is this like stripy tiger striped one with some like cyanobacteria right next to it. And then uh, I'm gonna probably skip through this part here. We did look at ASVs. There's a lot of um, uh, unique uh, uh, DNA samples here, or sorry, RNA. Um, so lots in the biofilm, less in the lakes. 
Um, what's interesting is if you actually do this non-metric uh, uh, dimensional scaling, um, you have pretty clear distinction between your different sites. So the soils are distinct from the lakes that are distinct from the biofilms, and then these streams connect them all, which is super cool to see because that's exactly how this system works. And then lastly, we don't actually see many uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms. Most of them are chemo heteroautotrophic. So I won't talk about this just to move on with our summary here. Um, so we know that Lake Tinanilic is primarily fed by subglacial drainage um, with contributions from terrestrial systems. Its drainage history is really interesting. It used to be every decade. Now it's closer to five to seven years. In fact, I think it's probably getting closer to four years. Um, the streams draining the, the subglacial water have the highest total iron, um, but our soluble bioavailable iron is higher than our streams. Our DOC doesn't suggest that we have a dense microbial community, but there's stuff there. The iron concentrations in the lake are 20 times greater than the fjord, um, which is potentially important for biology, even if this isn't limited. Um, and then our preliminary ion data suggests that we might have nitrogen consumption in the stream. So really our big takeaway here is that these ice marginal lakes, which aren't included in many uh, drainage calculations, actually have the potential to drastically influence carbon cycling for coastal waters. Um, so our big like takeaways here, right? So I posed a couple of questions, a question. How does meltwater production record warming and influence biogeochemical cycles? So just a quick summary. We know that these glacial meltwater ponds in the central Transantarctic Mountains are sentinels of change, but we really need more studies from the community to understand the extent of warming in the Antarctic interior. The storage of subglacial water um, and rapid release likely supports primary producers in the photic zone of Arctic fjords, um, and we should expect an increased frequency in outburst, outburst floods. Um, some lakes will probably decrease in size once the glacier thins, but that also means that we might have more area uh, for those lakes to fill. So I'll skip through my acknowledgments um, and leave you with this slide of our send off from Shackleton Glacier as we're about to like head off on this uh, Basler Plain. Hey, thanks a lot, Melissa. Uh, do we have any questions? Hi. Um, I know. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn on my. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Very interesting. And uh, uh, I come from the ocean modeling community and biogeochemistry, uh, carbon cycle, and so forth. So um, I find interesting your results. I know this is not a major topic right now. Uh, um, right now in your talk, but I was wondering, how do these large uh, iron and maybe other uh, primary production rates in the fjords in Antarctica relate to larger scale uh, signatures that may be transported by the currents um, and would affect obviously, you know, this is a very sensitive area of the subpolar gyre uh, in the North Atlantic. And secondary question is, do you have you seen or do you know of studies uh, around this topic in Antarctica? Thank you. That's two good questions. Um, so thinking about transport, as I said, the, I, the soluble iron concentrations are actually quite high in these lakes. Um, iron is not typically limiting in this system just because it's so close to the uh, coastal environment. However, um, and I was telling uh, Patrick earlier that I really need to get on this paper, um, but we actually show that these lake outbursts are so dramatic that it actually washes out the water from the fjord out uh, deep further out from the coast. So we know that you step away just a couple of uh, tens or hundreds of meters right from the coast and now these nutrients start to be limiting again. So we're seeing that it's a couple of different things. Not only are these systems so nutrient rich, and unless you dump a whole bunch of other nutrients in them, uh, this iron isn't likely going to be consumed. 
However, because it's such a drastic outburst event, it actually flushes so much of that water um, far out from the coast. And I think there it can actually play a pretty important role in affecting primary productivity. Um, in terms of systems like this in Antarctica, it's a bit more complicated and difficult because most of our coastal systems are ice covered. So even if you do have some of that subglacial drainage, you probably have right your ice shelf that's capping the top. Um, so you don't really have that same, uh, I think, drastic flushing uh, that you might have in, uh, uh, in the Arctic. I think that's going to change, though. There have been some recent studies, like from Lake Untersea, um, that have shown that there are glacial lake outburst floods in Antarctica. They're just not as common right now. Less place to store that water. Thank you. I'll reach out for some of the references that you mentioned, and perhaps we could see if we could add these processes in our climate model. Yeah, that would be really cool. Thank you. Any other question? I guess we're at the hour, so I guess we can probably stop there. So yeah, thanks if that. anyone wants to chat geochem, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. Be great. And hopefully somebody wants to take on this really hard and tedious task of uh, quantifying meltwater ponds <laughs> in high southern regions. 